All right, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we're gonna get started here in just a minute or two, but I wanted to do a quick sound check just to make sure everyone can hear us. If you could please type in the chat box that you are hearing us fine, that would be great. And I'm also gonna let um, Michael say hi really quick here just to make sure he's being heard loud and clear. Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome to the session today. Excited to get started here in just a moment. Yeah, please type in the questions box if you can hear us. it would be much appreciated. Okay, perfect. All right, awesome. All right. All right. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we are coming to you live today from our Somerville office in Somerville, Massachusetts. Rainy Somerville, Massachusetts today, not as cold. Um, I am going to get started here, or I'll pass things over here to Michael um, and Nathan in just a moment, but I wanted to run through a, a few housekeeping notes before we get started. All right, so first of all, this class is being recorded, um, but it's meant to be interactive. Um, so as we go, please feel free to ask questions. That's why we have two technical engineers here today that I so rudely did not, <laughs> did not, um, you know, let Nathan say hi, but um, I, I'll, I'll let, I'll pass things over to them in just a little bit. Um, there is an exit survey on the way out. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking that, we would love to get your feedback. So before we dive in here, um, I just want to make sure that um, everyone understands who Smart Bear is and what we're all about. So we focus on providing software quality tools for teams. And specifically, our goal is to infuse quality and speed into the entire software development life cycle. So there's a lot to cover here on this slide, but for sake of time, um, I just wanna quickly share you know, the breadth of the Smart Bear product portfolio, covering the entire software development lifecycle, um, from development to testing to operations across both the API and UI layer. Um, our products enable teams to deliver the best software faster than ever. So here's our team today, minus Nathan. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Michael Hawley is our technical engineer and also Nathan is one of our technical engineers and I'm Lauren Parker. I work with customer success. So let me pass things over to Michael and Nathan so they can run us through the agenda. Um, give me one second here. Sure. All right. All right, excellent. Uh, welcome everyone. Just to reintroduce myself, my name is Michael Hawley. I'm a, a technical engineer here at SmartBear. 
Um, today, I also have with me Nathan Wright, who's uh, another member of our technical engineering team, and he's going to be uh, handling any questions that you might have. So, you know, fire away. He's he's available for you. So just to go over the agenda real quick, we're going to do a, a brief overview, maybe a couple minutes, about the API ecosystem and sort of where it's going, what we what we see um, with the conversations that we have and the the trends that we see. Um, we also are going to go over some some common approaches to API development, a design first versus a code first approach, uh, some of the challenges that we've seen um, just in general with with API development, and that's sort of where Swagger Hub comes in, uh, how we can address those challenges and, and where it fits in that uh, API development workflow. Then, of course, we're going to get right into the product. Um, we're going to go over uh, the the UI and some of the the functionality um, just f right from the get go. The first view that you see. We're going to talk about organization and then sort of our, our plan today. We're going to go over a sample API that we're going to be uh, working on, uh, using of the editor and some of the the great live documentation um, that comes with that. Uh, reusing assets, so you have a nice standardized um, format between all of the different API designs within your organization. Then we're going to get into versioning and forking. And this is really important um, at every stage of design and development, making sure that your, your versions um, are clear, being able to uh, collaborate on these designs, uh, as well as forking. So any additional resources that you bring in uh, for these designs, additional teams, they'll be have uh, great access to your designs, um, as well as being able to, to merge it back into the final project. And, and we'll take a look at uh, the uh, feature that we have for, for merging back uh, into a, a version. And then last but not least, the real important stuff, the integration. So we um, integrate with some of the heaviest hitters, API gateways, um, repository tools like GitHub, uh, as well as code generation with, with SDKs. So we uh, can generate these uh, frameworks for some of the most common technologies and languages uh, in the tech industry. All right. So generally what we see uh, in the API ecosystem is that it is constantly growing. Uh, the idea of an API has been around for a long time, longer than you know, our modern uh, definition of the web um, just used as uh, the uh, communication between different applications there. And that's really what it's about. But now in our IoT world, our phone communicates with our car, with our thermostat, and all these different devices that we have around the house and that's constantly growing, we need a standardized form of communication between all these devices, and that's that's where APIs come in. So having a nice, clean design and being able to standardize and, and collaborate uh, on these API designs is, is really important so all these devices can communicate with each other uh, easily and, and quickly. All right. So the two common approaches that we see within uh, API design and development is a uh, design first approach and a code first approach. No matter what though, they start with a business need. So a, a team of analysts um, get together and, and say, we need to fill this particular need um, within the market or, or internally. And an API is, is definitely how we're going to address that need. Then they come up with a strategic document outlining um, the, the requirements of that API design um, and then send it off to our development team. Then that development team can go into uh, a few different ways. First is a, a service contract, and that is your uh, swagger definition. Um, from there, they can, they can version that, make it the best possible um, API definition possible, and then from there generate their server or client side SDKs. Alternatively, uh, if your developers 
are especially daring. They can uh, work on the application right from the get-go. They know exactly what they're doing um, and, and use that code-first approach and, and get started immediately. Then generally what we see is after the fact they create that documentation, they sort of fill out um, the, the uh, functionality um, of their, their API so they can share that off with the, the rest of the team um, and their customer base. And then finally, they create that, that contact and uh, contract and that documentation um, in a little more standardized way uh, via a uh, Swagger spec. All right, so some of the challenges with uh, traditional design and, and development of our APIs is the uh, inconsistencies in design styles uh, across our APIs. When a developer gets a list of requirements, they're going to interpret it in, in a different ways. Uh, and every developer has their own uh, style of developing and, and uh, you know, just from the little things like underscores versus uh, camel case and things like that. So every, each designer interprets uh, different requirements differently. And that causes a lot of confusion. So there's uh, less standardization in designs. Error codes for, for the same thing are going to be different across uh, different applications. So there's not a lot of standardization there. And we see, and we, we've definitely heard a lot about this, um, these service contracts, these, these uh, API designs um, come in the form of uh, Word documents and web pages that constantly need to be updated uh, every time a new version is, is developed. So there's not a lot of collaboration and it gets really messy. Um, this results in a loss of speed and, and time um, when iterating through designs. There's not a really common uh, workflow um, that is across uh, an organization um, and that really bogs things down. And then of course, when there's a loss of, of time, there's also a cost involved making sure that the uh, APIs are hosted, uh, privacy is managed, and that, that infrastructure is, is maintained uh, in a meaningful way. That, that all costs money in the long run. All right, so what Swagger Hub can do to address these challenges is design, define, and develop API documentation. We have clean collaboration across teams to share uh, documentation securely. We can set up these advanced read-write permissions based on roles uh, within, excuse me, an organization and the teams, uh, different teams of users. Um, like I said before, we can generate client and server SDK so you can get started immediately as soon as uh, your uh, API uh, document is the version and meets all the requirements that are needed. Um, we can manage that documentation in a, a meaningful way with versioning, forking, and merging to uh, ensure uh, the best possible collaboration um, and, and versioning possible within uh, that documentation. And we also integrate to support the API lifecycle. So um, you can go from that design phase to the development and testing phase as, as quickly as you can um, in, in, through our integrations. All right, so let's talk about the actual uh, workflow we're going through today, talk a little bit about our, our example user story. So we are creating a SmartBear API. This is gonna be developed across multiple platforms, uh, web, mobile, what have you, and all of those platforms are going to be using the same API to, to standardize the entire process. Uh, this is going to be an HR API, so we're going to be able to retrieve and submit employee data with a get and a post method. And then we're going to break down our organization into architects with uh, read and write uh, permissions, our development team, and our QA team. All right, so this is what the API is going to actually look like. We've got a single user, um, we've got, or a single uh, resource, our users. We've got a get and a post method, and we've got um, additional parameters and a post body um, requirement. 
And then for our responses, we've got the standard 200 response. So we can see what the uh, API is gonna return once we make a call to this. And we have a single standardized error message. And we can do that in a couple of different ways, um, either locally in the, the design, um, as well as uh, reusable assets um, within an organization in Swagger Hub. All right, so phase one, um, we're gonna we're gonna break this demo into a few different phases to make it nice and organized. Um, I'm gonna be introducing the UI. I'm gonna show you how to create organizations and teams within that organization, um, and further breaking it down into working into particular projects. So this is where you're gonna keep um, your the actual API documentation, uh, these different designs, and how to keep things nice and organized. So let's get into the tool. Pardon me. All right, so this is the My Hub view. This is generally what you're gonna be seeing every time you log in uh, to Swagger Hub. Uh, here we have this list of different designs um, that uh, I'm allowed to, to access uh, within the different organizations that I'm a part of. Right. We can also filter um, these uh, via this, this search bar, and we've got a number of different um, filters to, to further narrow things down. Um, so because we are the team behind Swagger Hub, we support out of the box Swagger 2.0 and Open API 3.0. Um, we can further break this down into APIs and domains, the domains being uh, reusable assets, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Public versus private, so um, these are basically going to be internal versus external APIs. Uh, state, published versus unpublished. Um, generally what we see is when a API meets its requirements and goes through some sort of um, authorization or review process, I should say, um, it's gonna be published. So we can see what uh, API designs are actually finished and, and ready to, to um, go into the next stages, right? And then of course, the owner, your private um, APIs that you're personally working on versus the different organizations that you're a part of. So we're able to filter out these in, in a meaningful way. We're able to um, make sure uh, we can we can see exactly what we're we're looking for and, and use those filters to get at certain designs very quickly. Right. Next, I'm going to be getting into organizations. So uh, the the gear at the top right. Uh, if we go into organizations, we can see that I'm part of two of these: uh, SmartBear Software, which I'm an administrator for, and SE Design, which I was invited to. So we can see the difference between those. Right. If you want to add users, we could certainly do that. We can invite users based on their email or their Swagger Hub uh, username, and then we can um, define our user groups. Uh, break them down in uh, between members and, and owners within that particular organization. Right. From there, this is where we're going to be uh, managing our different user groups, our architects versus our consumers versus our developers. And then once we actually get into the uh, API design, this is where we're going to be uh, setting those permissions, uh, making sure that our uh, architects have uh, full read-write privileges. Um, our consumers can can view, but actually can't edit um, those designs. But you know, still we we want them to be able to see uh, the designs that they're going to be, t be potentially using. Um, and our documentation team, we want to make sure that they have they have full access as well. All right. So you're starting to see how we can organize our different users, break them down into different user groups. Um, but we also want to be able to break down these different API designs that we're going to be working on and further organize them. Um, so the way we can do that is once you're a part of an organization, um, if you want to start off on a new project, um, it's, it's a very simple setup. So we're going to create a new project. 
going to give it a name. So new SB uh, HR. If you already have an API or a domain, um, we can search for it. Um, I currently am going to start from scratch, so uh, not do that quite yet. And then we can add any users within an organization to be part of this project. So if we want to add Nathan, um, I simply search his name uh, and then click on it and add him to this uh, project here. All right, so that's the easiest way to get started. Um, pretty pretty quick process there. Um, from here, we're going to create um, our uh, API, uh, and we can see a, a sample project here. There we go. Smart for HR and a domain. So we can keep everything nice and organized, and we can even set um, those specific permissions to private or, or, or public to, and, and invite users um, to, to join us. So that is uh, more or less uh, phase one, as so we looked over the, the UI and how we could filter um, with that, that MyHub view. Um, we saw how we can define our different organizations, invite users, break our users down if, into teams, and then we'll, later we'll get on into uh, setting those read-write permissions. Um, and we're also able to work within projects. Um, and then we're going to add uh, different API designs to a single project. And we saw how we can invite users uh, onto that project as well to break things down and organize further. All right. So for phase two, we're going to create a new API design. We're going to take a look at how we can use those teams that we've created and set those read write permissions based on their role. We're going to take a look at the live documentation. So as we are working on our uh, Swagger document, we can see uh, in real time any errors that pop up and the methods and parameters, inputs and outputs um, being populated in that documentation in real time. And we're also going to talk about commenting, how we can um, make comments and, and send off notifications um, in, in a really meaningful way for further collaboration. So let's get back into the tool and create a new API. For now, I'm just going to stick with the uh, 2.0 version to really show off uh, the features that we currently have. Um, we're constantly working on new versions and further uh, integrations and features for the 3.0 version, so please keep an eye out for that if you are a 3.0 user. I'm just going to call this SP, let's keep the naming simple, so new SP HR API, and it's going to be 1.0. And again, we're able to uh, post and pull employees from a database. That's the, the purpose of uh, our API. I'm going to set this to private, turn off auto mocking. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, how we can stand up this service uh, and keep it within uh, SmartBear. All right. So we can see from here um, our view is split into the editor and the documentation. So we can see the title, we can see our version, the description here, and as we make changes to this, um, that documentation is going to be updated in real time. Before we get into that, though, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we can further um, collaborate and organize um, the, the users that are going to be making edits to this API here. So up here at the top, this little forking uh, icon here. This is where we can invite different users and different teams into uh, working on this design. And this is also where we're going to be setting up our different uh, permissions here. So view, comment, edit. All right. And now, yeah, I think it would be a, a good idea to actually just start working on this. So I'm going to keep things um, nice and brief, uh, not get too deeply into the weeds um, on the actual editor, but we do have a nice autocomplete feature um, that is able to let us uh, quickly spin up the, these API designs here. So uh, as we saw with our requirements, we have a user's path 
and we have a get method. And we can see already this snippet of uh, code, or you know, this little text snippet is going to be uh, help us get started as uh, quickly as possible. So when we click on that, we've got a summary, we've got a description, um, and we even have a tuner response that we definitely want to be using as well. Right. So from here, um, we can add a description that's going to be allow users to get employees. So I'm just copying and pasting that. Um, as well as additional parameters um, for this, this query here. So this is going to be a query parameter. Name of our user, a name of our um, parameter is going to be UUID. And set the data type, it's going to be a string. Uh, we want this required. The first and last name are not going to be required, so we're going to leave that out. But we definitely want this UUID to be required so we can grab uh, a user quickly in the database. Um, and then, of course, our description is UUID number. All right. And I can keep building out parameters, building out these, these methods here, but that's going to take a lot of time. So I'm just going to copy and paste. Um, and there we go. So you, cause we could be here all day. All right. And then lastly, I want to bring in this local definition. All right, so yeah, as, as we can see here, the, um, the errors are being populated automatically. We can, are starting to see our, our two different methods here. There's just got a couple of different issues here. So 404 response, just want to make sure that this is resolved before I moved on. Perfect. Always make sure you save your work. Very important. Uh, things go weird in weird directions if, if you don't do that. Um, all right. So from here, uh, we can see the live documentation. Um, based, we, we're starting to fill out these requirements. Um, we've got our required UUID. So that's nice and laid out for us. Um, we've got our first name and, and our last name, and that means we can query our database to, to return a response based on um, those different queries that we can make against it. Right? And we were also seeing a realistic um, example of the different responses that we get back. So this is going to be our 200 uh, model here with our UUID and information about this user, as well as the join date. Um, and and I want to especially show this off. This is our 404 error. And we can see that this is a local definition here. So we saw that pasted down at the bottom. And this is this 404 error is being used by both our get method and our post method. So it's especially important to keep things nice and standardized, make sure that um, you have a, a unified um, set of, of models there to, to keep things nice and clean. Um, be able to, to spin these up really quickly, make it once, reuse it a number of different times here. And, and down here, we can see how that's, that's defined down at the bottom here with our 404 response model. All right. 
Oop, oh, there we go. Excuse me. Great. So we have our design. This meets our requirements. So uh, what we could do is we could uh, publish this. Um, generally, before that process, it's going to go through some review, maybe some some revisions um, be, before we really get this started. Um, and based on that, our different users are going to be, you know, making comments and, and reviewing this uh, as we make changes to it. One of the ways that we could um, make those comments is over here on the left, as you can see, this uh, is being highlighted. We could actually click on a particular line. Right? We can see that uh, this comment field is being uh, popped up here, and I can say, "Hey, Nathan." Can you take a look at this? Um, and get that get that reviewed. And an email will go out to the team, and um, we'll be able to see you know where exactly that uh, comment is being placed on line twenty here. Um, alternatively, Nathan could say he you know I could tell Nathan that you know it's done, and he's going to take a look at this and he's going to make a comment and and tell me something I did wrong. Um, and then do the same thing. So we're going to make that comment. All right. One of us could reply to this. And uh, eventually, this is going to be resolved. So I'm going to resolve this now and remove this um, this little one here over here on the right. Left, excuse me. All right. So it's really important to make sure that uh, the different users collaborating on this have a clear line of communication. And commenting is, is a great way to do that. So we're actually um, able to reference specific parts of the API design and, and communicate with each other the, our different needs. All right. So that is generally um, uh, phase two of the design. I'm just going to take a few minutes. I'm, I'm sure there have been a lot of questions coming in. Um, Nathan, what do you what do you got to share for us? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, a couple of questions that I think uh, might be good to, to kind of throw out there and, and mm -hmm. field. Um, first one is Swagger uh, a smart bear product dash innovation? Um, is it something that you own essentially? I don't know if you want to answer that. Yeah, sure, sure. I'd love to. Um, so, Swagger is and isn't owned by Smart Bear. We are the team behind Swagger, but we have uh, donated it to the open source initiative uh, a few years back. And it is now the standard by which the open API spec is um, being being developed by. Yeah. Um, Swagger Hub is, is a commercial offering, but uh, yeah, the, the open source version is uh, made by us, but open source now. And we sit. Um which I, I think is pretty interesting. We sit on the board uh, for the open uh, API specification kind of team. Do you have to that? Sure. Um, so we're, we're heavily involved in kind of the future and the development of the process and, and the specification. Um, there's also a distinction to be made between Swagger, the specification, and Swagger Hub, which is uh, you know the, what we're looking at today and, and this kind of uh, collaborative space to, to design and build these, mm -hmm. these Swagger documents. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's something that comes up all the time, and as Mike said, it's a it's yes and no, and uh, it's a it's a pretty interesting relationship I think that we have with um, the kind of open source community as well as this professional offering that we're building out. Um, kind of to a different tune. Are those a question that came up? What is the meaning of public? Who can see a public API? Um, so I don't know if we want to talk a little bit about that and and kind of. Uh, maybe the on-premises versus kind of cloud solution and sure. what public means between those two. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have two different, uh, basically, licensing types for Swagger Hub. Um, the cloud uh, solution, so the, the not the enterprise, but the... Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we have essentially two, uh, two Swagger Hub versions that we can, we can offer. Um, the one that we're looking at today and, and we like to work with uh, here is the cloud-based solution. So uh, we host it, we maintain it, and it's always up, it's always ready to go. Because it's in the cloud, anything made public is public to everybody. Um, you know, that's the intent. It's if, if I'm building an API that I intend to be consumed by 
third parties, by by uh, general kind of users or, or kind of uh, people in the open source community, let's say, um, that's when we would see that public API be switched over, published, uh, and then anybody will be able to kind of view and consume it. Um, when we start talking about the the other uh, installation, and, and we generally see this used for larger teams and, and kind of enterprise uh, groups, um, it's an on-premises version. So it lives behind uh, a company's firewall, behind their kind of security protocols. Obviously, in that case, the general public won't have access to any of that information. So when uh, an API is made public in that on-premises version, anybody inside the, uh, the enterprise or, or inside the company would have access to it. They will be able to see it just because of its nature. Um, but there is that that firewall that's blocking anybody from outside of the organization being able to view. So it, it really depends on, on the installation. When we're looking at the cloud, um, it's easy to just say if it's public, it's public, you know, by kind of the dictionary definition that anybody can see it. General public can see it. Um, so it's a good question. It's something that comes up quite a lot. And uh, yeah, I, I should just say keep the questions coming. I, I love answering these in the chat. And, Absolutely. Uh, more than happy to go over these. All right. So um, before we move on, um, I just want to cover a uh, couple of topics. Um, yeah, publishing is is a really good one. It, it's not something I, I have touched upon yet, and I uh, intend to do so now. So, like we saw with our um, requirements that we saw uh, earlier in the in the slideshow, um, we needed that get and that post method um, in that sort of unified 404 response code. Um, this is the exact um, specification that is required. So what we're going to do is, you know, now that we've gone through that review process, I want to publish this. I'm going to make this, this public, right? So when we publish a version, it becomes static. So meaning uh, this read only pops up, so we can't make any additional edits to it. Um, but if we wanted to, within the tool, we could create a new version. And so there's going to be a run dot one dot All right, And we can even set this as a new default version when we select this um, from the main Swagger Hub view. Um, this is the first one that we're going to be seeing. So we're going to create a new version. There we go. And we can make additional edits to this as the, the read only is, is removed. Um, so we can keep working on this, keep going, and, and see, you know, f click through and, and see the evolution of this API design uh, all within this single um, accessible view here. All right. So now that we've talked a little bit about that, um, again, keep the questions coming. Nate's, Nate's here for you guys. Mm -hmm. um, let's get into the next phase of uh, our demo here. All right. So reusing assets. This is great uh, for, especially for large uh, organizations that really want to maintain that organized, standardized um, view. Our different um, users are, are coming in. They want to be able to see clean design um, in, in organization. So one of the ways we can do that is is creating domains, and and not only from a consumer side within. Uh, these designers, they want to be able to uh, call these different uh, response code and, and, and schemas for um, uh, inputs and outputs or you know, payloads and things like that. They want them to have it nice and organized already, make it once, reference it a whole bunch of times. Um, you know, a, a common phrase in the development world is, is dry. You know, don't repeat yourself. So that's one of the ways we can do that within Swagger Hub. Right? Uh, and those domains can be, like I said, response codes. Uh, they can be um, input bodies, parameters. Um, so, so we're able to define these different components here uh, and, and make sure um, that uh, we're able to make a robust set of components that are reusable here. And then last but not least, um, being able to reference these shared resources. So once we create a domain, we'll be able to reference it uh, within our different designs uh, multiple times within one API or across multiple APIs within an organization. Right. So let's get into the tool here and talk about reusing assets. Uh, I'm going to keep this uh, the way it is right now. Um, I'd say the best example of showing off domains is 
having one already set up for us. So within this design here, it's very similar to the one that we saw that we created. Um, we've got two uh, responses. Um, again, we can see that that sort of local definition here, but we also have that domain that we saw earlier. So if I delete this, right, and uh, using our uh, code autocomplete uh, feature within the tool, control space, um, we have this list of different models, different uh, references that we can make uh, all within our organization here. So we can use that 404 response. But we can also use this 404 error model. Right? And when we click on that, um, this link is populated. Um, and we can see that is a domain within this organization. So when we jump to it, this is going to be a separate file. Right? But in the same way that we can create our API designs, we can create these definitions, different error models. Um, and then, you know, plug and play as, as needed, so to speak. Um, we can even version this um, and, and, you know, make a lot of different changes to this for this um, as needed as well. All right. So when we go back, again, we can see that this uh, URL is used. But if we even go back even further, let me, let me save this. can even make that same change up at the top. All right. And then we go back to the uh, one that we were working on before and do the same thing. But, uh, you know, I, I feel like you guys are starting to get the idea. So we're able to create these domains, these reusable assets for, um, for example, this, this error model here and be able to reference it, um, you know, within our, our APIs here. All right. So now that we've talked about this domain, um, sharing resources, reusing um, these, these different assets over and over and over again, um, now we sort of get into the meat of things. I jumped the gun a little bit in, in showing off publishing, but I feel like it was you know, relevant to the question that came in. Um, definitely want to show that off. Um, and then uh, get, so we can, we can you know, talk a little bit more about that, um, but also just like the general uh, version controls, so being able to swap between the, the different versions pretty easily, uh, as well as forking and merging. That's going to be uh, another big topic for us. Right, so if we get back to the tool, um, let's say that we bring in uh, another team to finish up uh, this project. You know, uh, Nathan and I are going to be moving on to a separate project within our organization, so we've um, brought in an outside team, forked the version, um, make changes they need to, and then we're going to review those changes uh, and move it back into the uh, original version or, or a new version. So what I can do within Swagger Hub is fork this API. I'm going to be bringing it under my personal account here. Again, make this private here. And I'm just going to change the name. Uh, this is going to be my fork, and it's going to be uh, a 1.1. So when I fork this version, again, we can see this under my name. Uh, this is going to be a new uh, new name here. There we go. New SB HR API fork. Right. And the additional requirements that were sent in is to um, add a put method. So of the users that we've um, added to the database via this API, we want to be able to update them as well. So uh, I'll put method is, is required to do so. And I see any errors? Nope. Resources, responses. Here we go.
Perfect. So we'll save this. Awesome. And we can see that the documentation is updated in kind here. So we have our new put method. Beautiful. And then if we wanted to, we could add another 404 response. Perfect. All right. So now that these changes have been made, again, we're going to go through that, that review process as is uh, part of just the, the general workflow that we see a lot of teams utilize. Um, we want to go back to that uh, original version that was under the Smart Bear software uh, organization and then merge this uh, new version of the API to our original one. So what we're going to be doing is uh, under that gear, the compare and merge APIs option. Compare and merge. Then Swagger Hub. I'm going to search for my name. Right. And this is the, the API. Uh, this is the version here. And when we hit next, we can compare these two specs. We can even see the highlighted changes here. So that new put method is highlighted in green. Uh, we can see any uh, deleted lines. We can see any um, just different lines in general um, between the two different versions here. So when I click on this, and keep in mind we can bring in the uh, design and the metadata for so all these descriptions, formatting, everything like that. Um, we can break that in, or just the design only if we have you know different ideas on what the metadata should look like. All right, so when I click on this, this definition is brought into the original version. Right? And then we can save those changes and see how they're being updated here. So we're able to create this nice uh, fork merge workflow. Uh, any users can bring that under their um, ownership within Swagger Hub, all within the tool, um, create new versions, make those changes. And then once those are completed, we can bring them back into the original organization under a new current new version, uh, whatever you need there. All right, so yeah, um, to su summarize it, uh, versioning and, and source control is a really important part of the design development process being able to make sure that you're able to create these different versions based on your requirements. Uh, as new additional requirements are added uh, and, and other teams are notified and brought in, we want to be able to make sure they have access uh, and eventually be able to merge it back uh, within the original version. So it's the idea of that, that single source of truth um, that, that Swagger Hub fulfills. All right. So I see Nathan typing away over there. Um, I think now would be a good time to uh, pause this a little bit and address any uh, interesting questions that have been um, asked of us. Uh, sure. So someone's been asking, and I love these questions, someone's been asking about uh, whether or not Swagger as a specification is, is uh, useful for GraphQL, um, or if we can write a, a GraphQL definition uh, with Swagger. and. The short answer is is no. Uh, you know, it's meant for RESTful services. It's it's intended to be used with RESTful services. That's essentially the, the specification. It's like if we were to say, can we write a, a WSDL file for a RESTful service? Having said that, and I was just answering the question, um, I've seen some really interesting things done uh, where we've taken uh, RESTful services and, and wrapped them in a GraphQL interface. Um, when we start talking about doing something like this, having a swagger definition is, is going to really make that a, a much simpler process you know having essentially a list of, of or a set definition of exactly what that restful service does um, will give us uh, something to work against with that graphql service as well so th there'll be a direct relationship that we can kind of map out otherwise we'd be kind of fulfilling functionality i'm sure everyone who has written a piece of code knows you know, we could start to write something in that GraphQL service. We could think everything's checked out, everything's done, everything's mapped. Somebody, you know, is using the tool, realizes that, you know, if I submit this kind of query, all of a sudden we start getting errors back. That's the kind of thing that we would hope to catch or we would intend to catch by having a, a defined uh, RESTful service that we can then match up with GraphQL. So, um, you know, the specification itself is not meant for, for use with GraphQL, but 
there is a huge potential um, when we start looking at, at using GraphQL with RESTful services. And it, it's something that we see um, in, in some larger organizations and um, teams that have spent you know, a good amount of time you know, investing in RESTful services, um, but also looking forward to some of the potential um, that GraphQL offers. Uh, so it's a great question. Love, uh, love the, the question. I'm glad I could answer it here. Um, beyond that, um, let's see. Uh, there was a question about how um, we can essentially hook this up. There's a question about how we can hook up the open source version, but how can we hook up something like Swagger Hub to uh, like GitHub or, or uh, some kind of repository? So essentially, you could have live documentation based on what's being changed or edited in these Swagger definitions. Um, I answered it in line. Um, okay. I know that, Mike, you'll be getting into integrations a little bit later. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's a really cool piece of functionality that we, we do support and something that we can set up in, I don't think we'll do it today, but it can be set up in really a matter of minutes is, is kind of pushing data from something like Swagger Hub or an open source Swagger spec into uh, like a, a, a kind of a doc, documentation server. Yeah, I'll, I'll show that off uh, just briefly. Um, won't actually get too much into the, to the details about uh, GitHub, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a question uh, that comes up pretty often. Uh, so I just wanted to go over that a little bit later in yeah. the... Uh, um, um, another question that just came in, if we don't mind taking a second here to answer sure. it. Um, Absolutely. How to map an existing API into Swagger, or how to take an existing API and create a Swagger definition. Ah, okay. Um, so I, I, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. So um, currently within Swagger Hub, there's, there's you know, to be perfectly honest, there's no um, best way to go about it. Um, but based on our, our research, uh, Nathan and I have done a lot of research on this, um, there are some great uh, third-party tools to annotate and tag your code, um, be able to generate the JSON uh, or YAML format. So we'll be able to uh, annotate things like um, your models and your controllers um, and, and your validation points. Um, so, so we'll be able to generate those uh, using the existing code base, but it, you know, not within the tool, but there are some great third party um, tools out there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it definitely depends on the code base that uh, the API is written in. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of teams use this tool called Swashbuckle, mm -hmm. um, as Mike mentioned, annotate, parses through it, build swagger definitions off that. Um, so yeah, great question, and, and there's definitely solutions out there. Most of them are open source, okay. um, uh, like much of, of kind of Swagger uh, and the tooling around it. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, great question. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so um, let's let's sort of get back into it. Uh, I'm looking at this next slide here, and it, it looks like I've you know failed to fully realize Nathan's vision of, of showing off his his wonderful animation. <laughs> so uh, I'm just gonna show that off real quick all right so this is the the new fork created for the new team that we saw changes are being made so it's a powerpoint and then we're yeah and then we're uh <laughs> forking it back into the original version all right so uh our next phase is uh our integrations um so we're going to talk a lot about uh the different gateways that we can integrate with source control and virtualization and mocking and these are basically and take our Swagger uh, specifications to the next level, the next stages of the software development lifecycle, get into um, the design and further uh, design aspects of the uh, lifecycle and be able to stand these up um, and virtualize these services to, to fulfill like prototyping uh, requirements and things like that. All right, so if we go back into uh, Swagger Hub real quick, uh, we can see this plug icon uh, up at the top here. And this is where we're going to be um, adding our integrations. So before we get into uh, the different gateways we can uh, integrate with or, or the different repository tools, um, I just wanted to talk about the style validator real quick. This is a really important part of the uh, standardization process, being able to set these rules uh, that help us um, be able to address uh, a particular challenge uh, within uh, API design. And that is that, that, that challenge exactly is um, when you have this strategic document um, brought in by the, you know, your managers or the, the analyst, business analysts, um, 
you know, each developer has a different way of interpreting those. Uh, each developer has a different style uh, of going out and, and solving these these challenges here. Um, so what the style validator helps us do is, is set these rules to make sure that our API designs uh, look the same. And it's a really important process um, if internally making sure that all these, these resources and operations um, look the same so it's nice intuitive and be able to call these these different apis um, within these these different uh, platforms that they're going to be um, accessible by um, but also it's a, a nice clean organizational um, you know need for the consumers um, themselves they want to present your apis uh, in the best possible light so you have the most amount of adoption so we can enforce things like naming conventions, uh, underscores versus camel cases, um, making sure that all examples are, are uh, have uh, all models have examples and, and local definitions um, to sort of bring all, it, all this together and make sure all the, the assets are, are reused. Right? Um, so that's essentially um, a great way of being able to set enforce those rules um, to make sure we have this nice, clean, standardized design. Right. But the the meat of our conversation is going to be uh, the different gateways that we integrate with version control tools, and you know, keep in mind Swagger Hub is uh, one of the newer products within the Smart Bear portfolio. It's about you know a little over a year. Um, you know that we've we've launched this and we're constantly you know updating and adding these integrations based on our conversations um, with our user base and, and you know potential customers of ours. Um, so currently, as it stands, we do integrate with some of the heaviest hitters uh, in the industry. So Amazon, Apogee, uh, Microsoft Azure, and, and IBM. So we can stand up these and uh, designs and bring them over to a gateway. Um, but we're constantly taking feedback and we're, we constantly want to improve to make this the best possible product for um, you know, you guys over there on the other side, our audience, of course. In addition to that, um, we also integrate with Bitbucket, GitHub, and GitLab. Um, and I wanted to briefly show that off. So we're able to sync up uh, the current design to our repository tool, some of the, again, the most popular uh, industry standards. So this is gonna be my sync. I'm going to connect this to GitHub via OAuth. There we go. You can see the token being populated here. And then we can specify um, the repo as well as the branch, right? And so when we, you know, hit save, run this, um, we can uh, specify the specific branch um, that we want to send this off to. Um, and we can um, generate um, what we send off to Swagger or to uh, GitHub or Bitbucket, whatever. Um, we can specify that as well. So we can send over the design, so the YAML or JSON uh, definition itself, or we can generate these SDKs, send them over to GitHub or Bitbucket. Um, and these SDKs are our framework that we're going to be uh, developing on top of. So we've got these swaggerized routes. Um, we've got this nice framework um, to, to get started and sort of not have to go, um, you know, start completely from scratch, which is definitely uh, an improvement. All right. So like I said before, um, we can generate, um, you know, these SDKs uh, among some of the most popular languages and technologies um, in the industry. So, so Golang, Haskell, uh, Node.js, Rails, um, all these different client and, and server-side technologies um, that, that um, we, can, we can get started with. All right, and even if we're not um, generating these uh, and sending them over to GitHub, maybe we want, don't want to do that yet, um, we can do the same thing just from, um, you know, download these these different frameworks and uh, the the definition files here um, all within the tool itself so if I want to start off with a node.js server start building upon that and then 
afterwards send that off to GitHub, uh, that's certainly an option as well. So you choose that. All right. So it's uh, we are almost out of time. Um, the last thing I want to talk about uh, very briefly is API mocking. Um, so an integration that we have is we can stand up these definitions within the tool. I'll try to do this as quickly as I can. All right, so once we actually save this, there we go. Uh, we have this try it out button generated for us. So what we can do there is uh, add a user ID as a sort of required parameter. And when we execute this, uh, a curl command is being generated, as well as a request URL. So what we can do with that request URL, let's create a new tab, and actually hit this service from the browser. It's not particularly clever. It's always going to give back this response. Um, but this is a great way to get started, um, You know, being able to stand up uh, this API definition and then be able to have it consumed and, and validated by uh, an API testing tool something like uh, SOAP UI, for instance. Um, but also, we're able to consume this via a, a prototype uh, application front end. So we'll be able to make those API calls um, and be able to, to generate those uh, responses as well and, and bring those up to the forefront. So these are a great way to start uh, prototyping. Um, and they're not particularly clever again, but uh, this, is, this is a great way to get started. All right. So, um, we talked a little about the integration style validation to really standardize uh, the design of our APAs, kind of keep things nice and organized. Um, we talked a little bit about gateways um, and how we can integrate with AWS, IBM, Microsoft Azure, uh, et cetera there, and as well as GitHub, GitHub and Bitbucket and GitLab. Um, we can generate these SDKs so we can go from the design phase to the development phase um, very quickly and easily by generating um, code and, and generating these SDKs, um, as well as being able to stand these up uh, within Swagger Hub and, and sort of make these calls against it um, in prototyping. All right. So last but not least, if you want to talk to the team, you want to reach out to us, um, there are a few different ways to go about doing that. You can always tweet at us, at Swagger Hub, um, and we'd be happy to, to respond to you um, via Twitter. Uh, if you want to reference our documentation, you're, you're working on um, your design within Swagger Hub and you want a little more information, uh, we have some great documentation to, to help out in that process. Um, and if you have any issues, uh, please email us at support at swaggerhub.com. We'd be happy to help you out with any questions. And uh, you might even get me or Nathan responding to you mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, chances are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more than likely. All right. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to hand this back off to Lauren to uh, give us a, a nice little outro. Great. Well, thanks again, um, everyone, for joining us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, but forgot to mention, um, that the recording will be sent out um, in about an hour. So if there was anybody that jumped on or that registered for the class that wasn't able to make it, um, they, they'll also get the recording. Um, also, you can feel free to forward this along to other people on your team. They'll just have to enter in their email, um, but then they should get the registration link or the, the link to the, to the recording. Um, that being said, uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Nathan, for answering all those questions that were coming in. And thanks, everyone, for, for making it such an interactive class. Um, we really appreciate it. And it, if you could take the exit survey on your way out, we would... Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>